lot of my research has been looking at the basic findings that are being discovered with regard to intracellular signaling and seeing whether or not it applies to serotonin. For example, we didn't discover that phospholipase C is the second messenger pathway or phospholipase D is the second messenger pathway, but we discovered that serotonin A, specific serotonin receptor, is linked mm -hmm. to those second messenger pathways. A lot of my studies in the very, very early days were done in the brain, in brain tissue. The last decade, my studies were mainly done in recombinant cell lines where you take the cloned receptor and you express it in a in a cell that doesn't normally mm -hmm. express it, and then you can study that receptor in great detail because you can; those cells are, are clonal, and you can keep them going, and you can control the environment. And been a very, very attractive molecular tool, but the problem is that only tells you the possibilities; it doesn't really tell you what happens in the brain. Well, you're expressing this cloned receptor, and as a cDNA in a cell line that doesn't normally express the receptor. You assume that the mechanisms that you are defining in that cell are the processes that are going on in a neuron in the brain, but it is an assumption. And so one of the things that I've tried to do of late, I mean initially, you know, you're making so many discoveries, it's like you just keep going and going and going, and then finally you say to yourself, well, what does it really mean? Uh -huh. And so, you know, in the last few years, four or five years, I've been challenging the people in my lab to start thinking about what does it really mean. We know that hallucinogenic drugs interact and activate these signaling cascades and they activate multiple ones, some more than others. Is that really important to their behavioral actions? So, you know, we're now trying to devise ways to look at that. It's not easy, though. Friedland Seltzer used to always say, you can't fix a watch if you don't know how it works. That analogy mm -hmm. is true for the brain. You learn all these things about how these signaling cascades work, but then the question is, how does it all fit back together mm -hmm. to make the brain and to make the circuitry? That's a really hard thing to do, but you know, now we have animals that are genetically modified to not express specific molecules or to overexpress specific molecules, so you can begin to look at what the role of those molecules might be in behavior, for example. I have not myself been particularly enamored of those kind of studies just because you have all kinds of potential complications related to developmental problems. So, you know, if you knock out a gene in utero and the animal grows up with the absence of that protein, it could have major, yeah. major effects on circuitry or function of the brain that are independent mm -hmm. of the loss of that receptor uh -huh. in, the, in the adult. So that's the complication of those kind of studies. But they've been very insightful, given us some great insights. I guess I've always felt the need to try to relate my research mm -hmm. to behavior and, and to disease. I like to think that our biochemistry would drive the behavior and the behavior would drive the biochemistry, but really it was hard to link intracellular signaling to behavior. About five years ago, I had a student who wanted to take up the challenge of trying to determine whether or not all these things that we were seeing in these artificial recombinant cell lines occurred in cells that endogenously express the receptor. He developed some, in collaboration with a peptide chemist, some ways of blocking different steps in the signaling cascade intracellular steps. The key in those days for an endogenous system was to be able to get these molecules in the cell and then they would block at different steps, mm -hmm. but the problem is that they wouldn't penetrate into the cell. And so he collaborated with a peptide chemist to make them. And who is this? Then? His name was Mike Chang. This chemist had been working on ways to get peptides into cells and so he kind of took Mike under his wing and me under his wing, and we developed uh, some new tools for manipulating intracellular signaling in a native system. Still, this was cells, but it was cells that were expressed in the receptor. You know, I began to think, could I apply that to the brain, to mm -hmm. the whole animal? We couldn't really because these uh, molecules were hard to make, and we couldn't get enough to really 
you know, you'd have to give them intraventricular, and I didn't feel like they would diffuse enough that I could really interpret the results. And about two or three years ago, the experiments on using viral transfer kinds of strategies where you use a retrovirus mm -hmm. to infect cells and then they express a protein that you have linked to clone into that virus just like they would express the viral RNA they express mm -hmm. your protein RNA. That was done you know in some early days with uh, Parkinson's disease and primates and maybe we can use the strategy we're using in cells but to get these peptides that we were using to block signaling into the brain mm -hmm. and into neurons, we'll have to put them into a viral construct, which we have been doing using a lentivirus, which is actually a HIV virus. It's been manipulated so it's no longer infectious. Mm -hmm. But it infects non-dividing cells, which neurons are. If we could understand how those drugs alter neuronal function mm -hmm. to elicit their behavioral effects, then that could give us clues about what are the mechanisms of hallucinations in diseases like mm -hmm. schizophrenia. I'm interested in a broader sense with regard to hallucinogenic drugs, uh, defining the pathway or the circuitry that goes on in the brain. And we really don't know what the, what the circuitry is and what the sites that are really important in the brain for the action of hallucinogenic drugs. For antipsychotic drugs, for example, when we found out that the shell of the nucleus accumbens was a critically important site and you started looking at molecules and dopamine receptors and dopamine dynamics in that area very specifically, mm -hmm. you just learn so much all of a sudden. For hallucinogenic drugs, we don't have that kind of area. So I think I can use these lentiviral constructs because I can directly inject them into the brain, these mm -hmm. very specific slides. We model hallucinogens in a behavioral assay called drug discrimination, which is a paradigm where you train animals to recognize that they've been given a drug, some kind of internal cues. We have no idea what that cue is. It's probably not a hallucination. It's some kind of internal mm -hmm. cue that is specific to the class of hallucinogenic mm -hmm. drugs. Hallucinogenic drugs that have different chemical structures all will substitute for each other in this behavior. So an animal will actually learn to press, at first they're trained to press two levers to get food, and then you link one of the levers to hallucinogenic drug and the other lever to saline. They'll learn on the day they got the hallucinogenic drug to press the lever that's linked to that drug, and on the day they got saline to press the saline lever. And they'll do that with an accuracy of about 90%. And then you substitute another hallucinogenic drug, they'll press this hallucinogenic drug lever. Even one that's chemically unrelated, you give a psychostimulant, they'll press the saline lever. It's different from the drug mm -hmm. that they were trained on. So it's very specific. Again, I don't know what it really relates to, but it's very specific uh -huh. for that class yeah. of drugs. So that's what we mm -hmm. use to evaluate their action.